Welcome back guys. We're now on section 19.2, Coordination Chemistry of Transition Metals. In this section, we are going to list the defining traits of coordination compounds, describe the structures of complexes containing monodentate and polydentate ligands, use standard nomenclature rules to name coordination compounds, explain and provide examples of geometric and optical isomerism, and identify several natural and technological occurrences of coordination compounds. So this first picture here um, is to give you an example. Uh, our metal ions that have partially filled D subshells tend to form colored complex ions. Um, but when you have an empty D subshell or a filled D subshell, they tend to be colorless. And there's some examples here showing some different um, metal water complexes um, with different oxidation states from the metals and different types of metals. And so you can see that um, the ones that are D0s and D10s are colorless, but the others have colors. So transition metals don't bond normally like main group elements. They tend to form coordination compounds. And these are coordinate covalent bonds, um, which are a Lewis acid-base interaction in which both of the electrons in the bond are contributed by a donor to an acceptor. So there's two electrons, an electron pair being donated um, from what is called a ligand, um, to the central metal ion or atom, which acts as our Lewis acid or our electron pair acceptor. It's often a transition metal or an inner transition metal for the central metal. Um, and then the Lewis base donors, we call them ligands. Um, now, there, there are some people who call them, who says ligands, some say ligands. My brain tells me both because I've had professors who say both. Um, I was doing a little bit of uh, Googling and I found that just kind of what the what some people think is that chemists uh, tend to say ligand and biologists and, and some biochemists tend to say ligand. So it means the same thing <laughs> um, and both are correct. Um, so these Lewis base donors, these ligands can be almost anything as long as they have one or more electron pairs that they can donate to the central metal. Um, the donor atoms, the ligands have a lone pair of electrons that can form a coordinate bond to the metal. So you have to have a lone pair of electrons for these coordinate bonds to form. So here's some examples. Um, just in A, we have some covalent bond, a covalent and an ionic bond. Um, so you see the covalent bond of carbon sharing electrons with hydrogen, each one donating one electron. And then in, in the second part, you see sodium chloride where you have the transferring of electrons um, and you have those ions. Um, whereas in B, we have a co coordinate covalent bond where a pair of electrons are being no donated to the metal center. And you can see all these lone pairs on the waters are being donated to the scandium in the center. So um, this ends up forming this octahedral complex that you see um, in 3D there. So let's go over some terms. The first is the coordination sphere. And this is the metal ion or atom plus its attached ligands. So you put brackets around the coordination sphere to say this is the coordination sphere itself. Um, it has a coordination number of the central metal and this is the number of donor atoms that are bonded to it. So for instance, if you have the silver ion Ag and H3, oops, two, okay, the coordination number for silver is two, okay, because you have two ammonias that are bonded to it. Um, a monodentate ligand means that there's a central metal that is connected, um, that means the ligand is connected through only one atom. Okay, um, the, this word dentate, okay, dent, think dentist, teeth, um, it's from the Greek word for one tooth, monodentate, one tooth, meaning they connect with the central atom through only one, one atom. A bidentate ligand, bident, two teeth. So they connect with the central atom through the with the central metal through two atoms that are in one molecule. And we'll look at some examples while I point that out. 
um, polydentate, meaning many teeth. So it connects to that central metal with more than one bond. Um, we can also call them chelating ligands. So polydentate ligands can also be called chelating ligands and the metal is called a chelate. So they form a chelate. Um, sometimes we identify it with prefixes to indicate the number of donor atoms in the ligand. So here's some uh, complexes. Um, in A here, you have, this is that silver with the two ammonias, and the silver has a coordination number of two because it has two of these ligands attached to it. Each of these ligands are monodentate because the NH3, they're only attached by one atom. In B, you have this copper chloride ligand, or chelate, if you will, um, and you have, these are all monodentate ligands because they're all attached just by one atom. Same with this cobalt, which um, the copper though here has a coordination number four and the cobalt here has coordination number of six. Um, these have similar geometries like Vesper, but we're gonna talk more about the geometries later, um, focusing mostly on octahedral. Um, but the, um, the silver complex is a linear, uh, is linear, the copper is tetrahedral, and the cobalt is octahedral. Um, so here's a couple, um, a couple other uh, ligands. So um, in A, you have this is ethylene diamine, and or it's abbreviated with EN as a ligand, um, and this has two atoms that have lone pairs that coordinate to a metal center. So you see these two lone pairs on these nitrogens here in this molecule. So that means this could be a bidentate ligand, which you can see over in B, where you have these ethylene diamines attached to this cobalt and each one has two atoms from the same molecule attached to the cobalt. So these are bidentate ligands that are attached to the cobalt because both of the nitrogens from the ethylene diamine are attached to the cobalt from their lone pairs. So it has three of these bidentate ligands. Here's a nice example um, of a chelate IRL. So this is heme, which is in our blood. And you have four nitrogen atoms from one molecule that are coordinating to an iron in hemoglobin to form a chelate. So this is a polydentate ligand. You have four nitrogens that are in one molecule coordinating to that iron. So it has four don donor atoms coordinating to one iron. This is another example. Um, you have platinum with uh, two anionic li ligands. Okay, and they're bidentate ligands. So they have an oxygen and a nitrogen on each side that are coordinating to the platinum. So you have these two separate ligands. Okay, and they are bidentate. That reminds me, I need to call my dentist. I think it's time for a cleaning. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna talk about naming these complexes. When you have an ionic coordination compound, you wanna name your cation first and the anion second. text. Um, okay, so um, in general you want to name your ligands first and then follow with the central metal. And if you have multiple ligands you name them alphabetically. When you have a negatively charged ligand you add O to the stem name of the group. If you have a neutral ligand, you use the name of the molecule, though there are some exceptions. When you have water as a ligand, we use aqua. When you have ammonia, we use amine. When you have carbon monoxide, we use carbonyl. And when you have nitrogen monoxide, we use nitrosyl. 
if you have more than one ligand of the same type present, so let's say you have two waters, you, you use a prefix to indicate the number. So usually it's going to be di, tri, tetra, penta, or hexa. Um, but sometimes you have a ligand name that already has one of these normal prefixes in it, or if it begins with a vowel, we might use bis for two, tris for three, tetrakis for four, tetrakis for four. Um, so that's one thing to keep an eye on. When your complex is a cation or a neutral molecule, your central metal is going to be spelled exactly like the element name and then followed by a Roman numeral in parentheses to indicate its oxidation state, kind of like the old days of ionic compounds. When you have an anion, we use ATE um, added to the stem name of the metal, followed by the Roman numeral designation of the oxidation state. Um, sometimes you have to use, we use the Latin name um, for that, that anion um, when the English name is just too clumsy sounding. Um, here's some examples of anionic ligands. Um, so F minus we would call fluoro, NO3 minus we call nitrato, nitro, nitrato, 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 I guess it's nitrate, so nitrato. Kind of sounds like a superhero, doesn't it? OH minus hydroxo, O2 minus oxo, oxalato for oxalate carbonato. Want to go make a nice carbonato? <laughs> so hopefully you guys can have some fun with these names. Um, and here's some examples also, some names where um, the starting one at table 19.2, where we have the complex as a cation. So you've got your anion and then the complex itself is a cation. So we had, no, we have a Cl3, so we have a chloride. So it ends with chloride. And then we see that we start with our complex name and we see in this first one that um, ammonia is our uh, complex, is our ligand. So um, that means it's an amine. And we have six of them, so this is hexaamine, and then cobalt is our metal, and in this case, it has the oxidation state of three. And the way we can figure that out is because we have negative three from this chlorine, and then the, uh, let's see, we have six ammonias. And so add that all up, you find your oxidation state of your cobalt and you get three. Uh, let's see. So you gotta remember oxidation states come into play as well. So we figure out your oxidation state from the metal based on the charges of each ligand and the overall charge of the coordination compound. So ammonia, NH3 does not have a charge. So it's zero, oops. And then chlorine is negative three, which is why then the cobalt has to be positive three. So that is where that positive three comes for the cobalt. Um, for the next one from table 19.2, we have, um, this is an ion, the whole thing, the whole complex is an ion, which is why it ends in ion to tell us that and the overall charge here is plus two. And then we have two chlorides. So we have positive two, minus two. For example, we have two negative one chlorines. And then we have four zeros for the ammonia. Uh, platinum should be four. Okay. So we have positive two overall. And so that needs to equal negative two from the chlorines plus whatever our charge for the platinum is. And since we need this to be overall plus four, the platinum here has to be positive. I'm sorry, we want positive two overall. So the platinum has to be an oxidation state of positive four. So that way four minus two gives us positive two. And we have four ammonia. So that's why we get that tetraamine dichloro because we have two chlorines. So we have these two different ligands here. So this is why those come first and then platinum four. So remember when you have more than one ligand, you need to put them in alphabetical order. Uh, I'm gonna skip down to this last one because this one's kind of crazy. So the first thing we notice is this is an ionic compound. So we have, there's our anion is SO43 and that's sulfate. So we're just gonna end with sulfate. 
And now let's look at our complex here. Our metal is cobalt. And uh, we'll come back to its charge in a second. And now we want to look at this ligand that it's got. So notice there's three of them. And the ligand itself is the ethylene diamine. And so notice it goes tris, then in parentheses, ethylene diamine. And that's just because this ethylene diamine is together. So the parentheses is just indicating, hey, this is one ligand. Um, you could also do, um, do en in parentheses. Um, but notice now we're using tris. And remember it was saying that sometimes when you have um, a vowel that starts the, the ligand name, or if it already starts with di, tri, tetra, um, but in this, in this case, it starts with a vowel, ethylene diamine. So saying like triethylene diamine, which to me sounds fine, but um, in this case, we would say tris. So tris, ethylene diamine, cobalt, and then it's gonna be cobalt three, because um, we have three of these SO4s, which are one minus, so that's negative three. Ethylene diamine is neutral, so that means we need a positive three to neutralize our charge. So this is cobalt three. So tris, ethylene diamine, cobalt three, sulfate. Okay, the next one, we have um, examples where the complex is neutral from table 19.3. So this first one, we this isn't a, a salt or anything. This is just the whole complex itself is neutral. There's no cation or anion, um, starting with we have this first one, we have two ligands. We have ammonia and chlorine. And so we have, um, we have a diamine. So there, oops. Okay, since ammonia is amine, it's gonna come first. And then we have four chlorines, which means we have tetrachloro. So that means we have four negative ones from the chlorine. Ammonia is neutral. And we need this whole thing to be neutral charge. That means the platinum has to be plus four. So this is platinum four. Uh, this next one that we have, we have nickel as our metal. So sometimes you can identify your metal and then just put it at the end, figure out its charge later. Um, and then we have again, two ligands. We have two chlorines and then we have that ethylene diamine. So chlorine is going to come first since it's alphabetical and we have two so this becomes dichloro. And then ethylene diamine uses the alternative naming using bis instead of di. So this becomes bis and then in parentheses ethylene diamine or en nickel. And then we have two negative ones from the chlorine so that means nickel has to be plus two because the ethylene diamine is neutral. And lastly, table 19.4, we have examples where the complex is an anion. So this first one, we see platinum with six chlorines on it. And so that means we have a hexachloro. And since this is an anion, that means we have to add ATE onto the end for the metal. So platinate. And since this is an overall negative two, we have negative two is equal to six times negative one. So that gives us negative six, and that means the, chlor the platinum has to be plus four. So that gives us this hexachloroplatinate four ion. And then we ended with ion because it's just the ion itself. We don't have um, a cation attached to it. The next one we see is sodium with an anionic complex. So sodium is gonna come first, just like we would do in an ionic compound, put the metal first. And then now let's look at our complex itself. We have six chlorines, so we have a hexachloro. And then in this case, tin, cause saying tinate just sounds weird. So we're gonna change to stannate for tin. So um, your book gives you the the breakdown. So ferrate we use instead of saying ironate, plumbate instead of leadate, stannate instead of tinate. Um, those are some examples um, of using their, their Latin name instead of their English name. So I don't know, ironate sounds cute. <laughs> um, so this is saying stannate instead of tin. And then it has a charge of four since we have a positive two from the sodium negative six from the chlorine, 
and we need this to equal zero, so that means that this 10 needs to be a positive four. So let's look at an example, looking at some coordination numbers and oxidation states. Uh, we want to name these complexes and give the coordination number of the central metal atom. So the first one, we're given Na2PTCl6. So we can tell we have two sodium pluses, and we know we have a sodium that goes in front for our name. So that means we have some two plus. So we have a positive two already, and we have six negative ones. So we have two positive, here we go. So we have two positive ones. I'm just gonna rewrite this. Plus six negative ones, so that gives us negative four. And this needs to equal zero, so that means we need a positive four for our platinum. So platinum has an oxidation state of four plus. And we have six chlorine, so we know we have sodium at the start, and then we have a hexa chloro. And since this is an anion, since we have a cation, that means this is a platinate, and its charge is four. So this is sodium hexachloroplatinate four. And then the coordination number is six. You have six ligands attached to the platinum. So for B, we have this K3FeC2O43. Um, the coordination sphere has to overall have a charge of negative three because we have a plus three from the potassium. So we have three positive ones plus oxalate. Each oxalate is a negative two and we have three of them. So we have two times negative three. So that gives us four minus six, that gives us negative two. Uh, what did it do? Uh, right, let's see. Oops, sorry. Yeah, wait, wait, we have three times negative two. So that gives us negative six. Well, if we want to just look at the coordination sphere, we can say, since the coordination sphere here is negative three, we can say, okay, oxalate, each oxalate is negative two. We have three of them, so that's negative six. So negative six plus some X is equal to negative three. So that means our iron has to be a charge of positive three. So now we have a potassium to start our name. And in this case, since we have iron, it's gonna be a ferro, um, but we first need to start with our oxalate. And since oxalate starts with an O, we're gonna use tris instead of tri. So this is tris ox, oxalato, <laughs> oxalato. Isn't that cute? Ferrate. Since ferrous, now we're gonna change it to eight, three. Now, oxalate is a bidentate ligand. So that means it has two places that it will bond. So since we have three oxalates and it's bidentate, that means it has a, this is still a coordination number of six because there's six attachments. So don't be fooled by the, um, by, by the subscript. Make sure that you look at the structure of the ligand and make sure it's not something that might be bidentate or tridentate or polydentate. All right, so C, now we have where our um, complex is a cation and we see we are ending with a chloride. So our coordination sphere has a charge of plus two since we have a minus two on the outside. So we know our name is also going to end with chloride. Looking inside, we can see we have two ligands. We have a chloro and an amino. It 
so the ammonia amino has a charge of zero. We know that we need a plus two for a coordination sphere in total. And we have one, negative one for this chlorine. So we have some plus X to give us negative two. And to give us, sorry, positive two. Oh, yay. Yeah. So that means that our cobalt must be po uh, have a positive three. And we have five of these amines. Um, so this is a pentaamine. Pentaamine or pentaamine. I actually don't know if it's pronounced amine or amine in this case. And then we have one chloro. So we're just going to say pentaamine chloro. And then cobalt. So make sure this is all one word for your complex. Cobalt three space chloride. So these are pretty big words. <laughs> and then our oxidation number, or sorry, not oxidation, coordination number here, we have a total of six ligands. Even though they're two different ligands, we have a total of six, so we have a coordination number of six. So we're going to talk a bit about the structure of complexes. Um, and we're mostly going to be focusing on octahedral. Um, I'm not going to quiz you on other ones, honestly. Um, just to, I just want you to know that the most common structures of complexes are octahedral, tetrahedral, and square planar. And their geometry is determined by the coordination number around the central metal. Uh, non-bonding D electrons do not change the arrangement of the ligands. We don't care about the non-bonding D electrons in, when we're looking at these complexes for their structure. Um, for example, octahedral complexes have a coordination number of six. And you have six donor atoms that are arranged at the corners of an octahedron around the central metal at ion. Okay, so you have an octahedron, each corner of it has a ligand. If you have a coordination number of four, you can have two different geometries, either tetrahedral or square planar. And we use what's called crystal field theory to predict um, which type the structure actually is. And crystal field theory comes along in the next section, but we really don't talk too much about square planar versus tetrahedral, honestly. Um, but if you have a tetrahedral shape, each ligand pair forms an angle of 109.5 degrees from each other. Where a square planar, each ligand has two others um, from it called at 90 degrees. And these are called the, called the cis positions, cis meaning the same side. And then they have one ligand that is at 180 degrees from that ligand, which is called the trans position, meaning opposite side. Um, and cis and trans are actually very important. We'll talk about them when we talk about isomerization. Um, but when you go on to organic chemistry, um, cis and trans become very important to understand and be able to identify. Um, and actually, I don't know if we'll go into it too much when we do our intro to organic chemistry weeks um, starting in two weeks, but we'll see. Um, there's some coordination numbers here showing their um, potential molecular geometries. Um, you can see there's like a whole list of them, but the most the, the most common are octahedral, uh, what did we say, octahedral, tetrahedral, and square planar. Um, these are some weird um, geometries for when you have some coordination numbers of seven and eight, just kind of showing you kind of what they look like. Um, so these are some different octahedral geometries when you have um, these coordination numbers of six. So all three of these have coordination numbers of six around the central atom. So you can see even like the center one with this bidentate ligands, the chromium still has six ligands that are attached to it. So that makes it octahedral. Um, and we end up getting bond angles of 90 degrees around the central atom with the adjacent ligands. Um, and remember that only ligands within the coordination within the coordination sphere itself are affecting the geometry around the middle center. You could have like you have these ions on the outside. These do nothing for the geometry um, of our coordination sphere. Um, when you have coordination numbers of four, you can have a tetrahedral geometry like in A. So the zinc has coordination number four and it's tetrahedral or square planar um, as shown in B. Um, and this here is the cis isomer of this um, structure. You see these 
and H3, you see they're on the same side, and the chlorines are on the same side. And we'll look more into that later. As we're first going to talk about isomerization, or is isomerism in this case. Um, the first thing you need to know is what an isomer is. Isomers have, are different chemical species that have the same chemical formula. And there's many different types of isomers. Um, the first type that we're going to talk about are geometric isomers. And these are connected through space with the same types of bonds, but with differences in their orientation in space. Um, so we can have, for instance, uh, ligands that are in the cis or the trans positions. The cis configurations mean you have two ligands that are adjacent or on the same side as each other. Uh, the trans configuration means they're across or on opposite sides of each other. Um, these are different compounds if, when they're geometric isomers. They have completely different properties, different colors, different dipole moments, different solubilities, different reactivities. Um, you know, for example, if you have you know some cis isomers, they might be polar, but then you go to the trans isomers and you have then this 100 this 180 degree difference, and those dipoles cancel each other out, making a nonpolar molecule. So these can be completely different. Um, here's an example, um, looking at a cis on the left side of this cobalt water complex and trans on the right. When you look at this, I know it looks almost the same, right? But the connectivity is actually different. Um, I can't rotate things around where like this water and chlorine end up being in the same spot. They're actually different. You cannot put them, you can't superimpose them, put them on top of each other. So this difference can change the color. So we have violet versus green. Um, and yeah, it can make a big difference. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting there, right? Okay. So example 19.5, it wants us to look at um, the structure from the figure we looked at a couple slides ago, which I reposted here. Um, identify which isomer it is and then give its full name of the isomer. So this is the picture that it was referring to. So when you look at it, we see that the two chlorines, for instance, are on the same side. They're 90 degrees from each other. Same with the two ammonia. So that means this has to be cis. So that means the other form is going to have to be trans. So to do that, we're going to switch a chlorine and an ammonia. So now we're going to take this platinum and we can actually just use straight lines here. And now we've drawn this as trans. So now when you look at this, we have a 90 degree difference between the two chlorines or the two ammonias. So now this compound, we need to put trans in front of the name. Um, when you're typing cis or trans, you would do it in italics, but when you're handwriting it, you, you underline it. And then we put a dash. So this has to go in the front when you're trying to specify if it's cis or trans. And then we see that we have two ligands. We have a chloro and an amine. So we have two amines. So this is a diamine. And then a dichloro. and platinum and the charge on platinum here has to be two because we have two minus ones from the chlorine so platinum has to be positive two so then that is the name and there's the structure um this is probably as really difficult as i would give you guys um as far as a test question. Um, I, I want to make it would want to make it pretty obvious the cis and trans because it's hard to tell for something like an octahedral. Um, so I might give you something like like this, just maybe with a little bit of a different structure, like a different central metal and maybe different ligands, but um, very similar to this. So now we have a different type of isomer that we're going to talk about, and these are optical isomers, also called enantiomers, and these are very very important, especially in organic chemistry. Um, and these occur when you have two objects that are exact mirror images of each other, but you can't line them up or superimpose them where all parts are going to match. So these are non-superimposable mirror images. One example is your hands. If you look at your hands, 
you can put them together. They're perfect mirror images of each other. But if you try to stack one on top of the other, it doesn't work. Your thumb ends up lining up with your pinkies. That's not what we want. We would want them to line up perfectly where thumb to thumb, pinky to pinky. That doesn't mean you go and try to like warp your hand weirdly around or something. You know, we're, we're talking about just putting one on top of the other. Um, what's interesting is they tend to have identical properties. Boiling points, chemical properties tend to be the same, but some of their physical properties can differ, such as smell. Um, one um, enantiomer pair in nature um, is, uh, are called carvones, um, and these are, could be things like caraway versus spearmint. So if you're familiar with the smell of caraway, it's kind of got this sharp spicy smell, whereas spearmint is this minty smell. Um, so all it is is they're mirror images of each other, but that makes a big difference in their smell. But fun fact for you guys, 10% um, of people cannot smell a difference between these two carvones, and I am one of those people. I found this out the hard way when I was teaching a lab, an organic chemistry lab, and um, we were doing it on enantiomers, and we had some caraway and spearmint oil for the students to smell, and like kind of try to, they were supposed to like describe the smell. And when I did it myself, I realized they smelled the same to me. <laughs> so that means the receptors in my nose cannot tell a difference between those enantiomers. So they both smelled kind of both minty and spicy at the same time. And it was funny because my students came up and smelled them and were like, Dr. Viz, how can you not smell a difference? They smell so different. Like they, they just couldn't fathom it. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, so, but one of the major ways they differ, though, is how they affect polarized light. So, they'll, they, so most compounds tend to bend um, polarized light, um, and in, in antiomers, then bend it in opposite directions. Um, they also differ in how they react with other optical isomers. Um, so, for instance, um, DNA is an is actually an has optical isomers. So you have the right-handed DNA versus the uh, left-handed um, DNA, um, right-handed being what occurs in nature. So it's only going to bind to one isomer um, of some coordination complexes. The other one won't bond with it. Um, another type of isomer, we have linkage isomers, and these occur when we have a coordination compound that contains a ligand that can bind through the, to the transition metal center through two different atoms. For example, the cyanide ligand, CN, both the C carbon and the nitrogen have a lone pair of electrons, so either of them can bond. Um, if they bond through the carbon, this is called cyano, or if they bond through the nitrogen atom, it's called isocyano. Uh, we also have ionization isomers or coordination isomers, and these occur when you have one anionic ligand in the inner coordination sphere replaced with the counter ion from the outer coordination sphere. So, for instance, this cobalt hexachloro, or sorry, hexachloro cobalt bromide, then go is an has a coordination ion isomer with heptachloro. Or sorry, no, bromo heptachloro cobalt chloride. So notice they have the same formula overall. There's the same overall um, formula of CO, Cl5, Cl6, Br, but with how they're arranged, they differ. Um, so here's a couple example showing us uh, some non-superimposable mirror images. Um, for this complex, where M is a metal, and then you have ethylene diamine um, as your ligand. And you can see they're non-superimposable images. Even though they have technically the same linkages, you can't take one and put it on top of the other. They don't match up. So these are enantiomers. So if you're looking, trying to bond one of these with, with DNA, with right-handed DNA, only one of them will bond correctly. Um, here's another example of, this is diamine dichloro cobalt ion. Um, you have a trans isomer when you have the chlorines at a 180 degree angle, which is very different from the cis isomers, which are at 90 degrees. Um, and the cis isomers also have are mirror images from each other. So um, there are ways to tell the difference. We use the um, 
some other naming for these, but we're not going to worry about that <laughs> in this class. So we're going to talk about some uh, places you'll find these coordination complexes in nature and technology. One major one is chlorophyll, which is the green pigment in plants, and it's a complex with magnesium. Magnesium in this being a main group element, but it can form some coordination complexes. Um, chlorophyll is actually very uh, close to my heart, chlorophyll A in, uh, in particular. I did some research on it as an undergrad. Um, it was something that we would um, detect and quantify when I did uh, water quality monitoring for a couple lakes in SoCal. Um, and we did some research on some uh, methods of chlorophyll detection. So what happens is this chlorophyll, it absorbs red and purple light. And so then the light that's reflected out of it um, is missing red and purple. So that reflected light then appears green. So that's where that green color comes from. Another example of a complex in nature and tech is phallocyanine. And this is a square planar copper two complex and it's used as a blue dye. A major, major one that we saw earlier is heme, which is the iron containing complex in hemoglobin. Um, and heme itself is bonded to a large protein molecule, AKA globin, globin? I don't know, I'm not a bio person. Um, and it's bound by an attachment of the protein to the, the heme ligand, not the leme ligand. Uh, hemoglobin is used for transporting oxygen in the blood. Um, we also have some complexes used for water softening. Um, EDTA is a complex that's used as a preservative. Um, so you might see this as an ingredient in a lot of foods um, as a preservative. Um, it's also used quite a bit in analytical chemistry um, for titrations. Uh, British anti-lewicide or BAL is used for um, to treat heavy metal poisoning. So it makes a complex with those heavy metals, which then can pass through the body safely. Enterobactin forms iron complexes when, uh, when you have patients with blood diseases leading to iron buildup. So it bonds with the iron, lets it then um, pass from their body and eliminate it. It's also used in electroplating. And uh, more recently, cisplatin and some other platinum complexes are used for cancer treatment, but only the cis isomer. So hence the cis in that name. So on uh, A there, you see that's one of the example structures of chlorophyll. There's chlorophyll A, B, and some other ones. Chlorophyll A being the most um, prominent. Uh, they all have the basics, the same basic structure where you have this magnesium center uh, complex on four nitrogens. And then in B, you can see the structure of, of copper thalocyanine, which is blue and is a square planar copper complex. It's really pretty. Um, for my chemistry majors, when you go on to take inorganic chemistry, which is an upper division class, you get to make a lot of complexes and oh my gosh, they're so pretty. I think I still have some that our professor would let us save on. And like we literally made glitter in the lab. It, oh my gosh, such pretty, pretty complexes. Um, here's hemoglobin. So it has four protein subunits, each of which has an iron center attached to the heme ligand, which is those little red dots. Um, which is then coordinated to a globin protein. Each subunit is a different color. I am terrible at reading proteins. Um, so if you wanted like to look at this better, I highly recommend you take this picture to Dr. Nalbandian, who is a biochemist <laughs> by trade. Um, I'm sure Do uh, Mr. Sage or Dr. Rani or, um, yeah, they can also probably help you with, the, with seeing everything in this, but yeah, I'm not a bio person at all. <laughs> Um, this is EDTA um, and forms these hexadentate complexes. That's what that, there's, you can see the, the metal complex forming in the center there. Um, here in A is the British anti lewisite which is used again for heavy metal poisoning. Um, it coordinates to uh, metals, which is that M you see there, and then enterobactin in B um, helps rid the body of excess iron. Um, so we also can have transition metal catalysts um, which is another use of our transition metals. Um, so if you remember, catalysts increase the rate of reaction by lowering the activation energy, and then we regenerate it so it doesn't actually participate overall in the reaction. Um, a lot of times these are ligands also. Um, so vanadium oxide is an example for making sulfuric acid. 
Um, if there might be used in detergents, paints, fertilizer. Um, all of these tend to use transition metal catalysts. Catalytic converters, there's another example of a transition metal catalyst, so you tend to use platinum. So yeah, um, transition metals are all over the place, as are um, complexes. Um, this is Dr. Diana de Alessandro, and she's a functional materials researcher that looks at um, inorganic and physical chemistry fields combined with engineering, um, with transition metals to make new systems to power cars and convert energy. So she's awesome. So here's a quick example. Um, ligands like uh, BAL and enterobactin are important in medical treatments for heavy metal poisoning. However, chelation therapies can disrupt the normal concentration of ions in the body, leading to serious side effects. So researchers are searching for new chelation drugs. One drug that has been identified is dimercaptosucinic acid, or DMSA, which is shown below. And we want to identify which atoms in this molecule could act as donor atoms. So if you remember, donor atoms have to have a lone pair of electrons. So we have these oxygens can all be donors as well as these sulfurs. So there's six different potential donor atoms. Um, now, one thing though with the structure though is only two of these atoms can be coordinated to a metal at once, but you can see all, all four potential spots. Um, the most common binding mode with the DMSA, by the way, is where you have one sulfur and one oxygen uh, coordinating to make a five metal ring with them with um, a five member ring with a metal so like this sulfur and this oxygen here or this sulfur and oxygen would probably be the main two spots that I would guess 